Hello everyone, I'm Rishabh Goyal, I'm um, from Polity Finance and today I'm here to talk about uh, the true cost of education law. So traditionally, uh, people look at interest rate to understand what is the cost of an education loan, what is the interest charge on it, uh, but today I'm going to take out some time and discuss what are the different factors alongside an interest rate that you should be keeping in mind uh, to understand what is the actual cost out of pocket that you're paying towards an education loan. Uh, and what's on the agenda is number one, what is Prodigy Finance? Who am I on what basis? Like what is my knowledge of the products and uh, industry? So that's something I'm gonna talk about. Then I'm gonna define what is a cost, like what is a cost for you? Uh, and there are different types of loan options, secured versus unsecured, and what are the different costs associated with them? The next thing is about interest rate and how interest rate is different from the interest that is charged to you, uh, which can also include a lot of fees. And lastly, we have easy repayment and including all of these things comes down to your true cost. And once you've addressed that, I'll get to the Q&A. So jumping straight into uh, the, uh, what is Prodigy Finance? So we are a pioneer in community-based student financing. We provide education loans to international postgraduate students. And uh, very excited to announce that our investors have committed $1 billion uh, to allow students to study abroad at top education without any collateral, without any co-signer at comparative interest rates. A closer look would be that Prodigy Finance is the only student lender that allows students to fund their master's or MBA without burdening their parents. You don't need a collateral, you do not need a co-signer, you do not require your parents to be involved. We look at your admit, we look at the program that you're looking to attend, the post-master's salary or the salary you will earn after graduating. And with that salary, we understand the EMI you can pay. And if we know your future EMI, we can calculate the current loan you can afford. So we have been lending this for 11 years. Uh, that's a long time. And 11 years, uh, very happy to announce that we have lent over $500 million uh, to over 10,000 students. So those are great numbers. A big chunk of those numbers come from India. Uh, if you know any seniors, there's a big chance that they have taken a loan from us. And uh, I'm very, uh, but for now, for today, I'm not gonna talk about Prodigy Finance, I'm gonna talk more about education loans and what is the cost of an education loan. So jumping into education loans and costs, defining costs, what is cost? When it comes to cost, there are two types of cost. There's one simple cost, the financial cost, which is very easy to understand. That is the money that is coming out of your pocket. So any fees you pay, any interest rate that is charged against you, any repayment term, those are simple financial costs to which you can put a number. So if you know the financial cost, you're like, okay, this, this is the amount you borrow, this is the total amount you repay, this X amount is a cost to me. You have a subjective, you have a, sorry, you have an objective number to it. That's the financial cost. Then you have another type of cost where you cannot put a number is the emotional cost. Is the, for example, if, if you're looking to go abroad, like I also study abroad and I empathize that it is such a massive step in your life. Not just taking a huge loan to fund your education, but also moving to another country, like you know, country, moving to another continent, moving to a different time zone, moving away from your friends and family for most of you for the first time. Uh, and that's a huge step. And in the mix of managing everything, your admits, your funding, your visas, there's an extraordinary amount of stress and anxiety that is associated with that. If your application takes a long time to get approved, it just heightens that stress. If you feel uncomfortable with the lender or do not trust, that's again a stress. That's an emotional cost. If you're looking to take a secured loan, that is if you want to put up your house as a collateral, there's again an emotional cost because think about it. Um, a house is something that is either ancestral property, uh, which has, of course, a lot of emotional value, or is it something that was recently bought by a family with uh, your family saving wealth for X number of years to actually achieve that goal? And once you've achieved that goal, you're putting it up to the bank, which, which has an emotional cost. And lastly is the ease of repayment. 
Now, please bear in mind that when you take an education loan, you are associated with the lender for many, many years. It's not till getting an approved loan letter. It's actually till going to getting the disbursements, the money in the account to the university, to having everything sorted properly, getting living expenses, to even repaying back the loan. All of those things, are they easy or not? Are they stressful? Do you want to be in a situation where you work in a busy schedule and then you have to take out four hours every week to manage your repayments? Do you? Do you not? That's up to you, but that's a cost you should consider. So those are the different costs. And I just want to take some time uh, to discuss secure versus unsecured because in one of the previous webinars, uh, there were a few of you who said you did not know the difference. So basically, a difference is a secured loan is a loan where you put up a, an asset as a collateral, as a security against a loan. So if I am taking a loan of X amount, say 50 lakhs from a bank, if I take a, a loan of 50 lakhs from a bank, the bank requires you to put up a security against that amount, which is usually a house whose valuation is more than 50 lakhs. On the other hand, there are other lenders, including Prodigy Finance, where you can take a loan without any need of security. How? They understand data, uh, they understand uh, multiple things to, to predict how likely you are to repay back in the future. That's the main difference. Secured loans, you need to put up a house or a, or a security, unsecured loan, none of those things required. Now, oh, Okay. Yeah, so when it comes to secured loans, just want to do a, a two by two analysis of pros and cons. Uh, there will always be some people who would be uh, looking primarily at secured loans because they believe that putting up a security or an asset can uh, improve the loan terms. They can reduce the interest rate by a nominal amount or they could reduce your uh, fees by an XYZ percent. But, and that's what they, they believe. That's the, uh, the financial benefit they believe uh, that this can help. However, however, uh, the con is that you put up a, a appreciable asset, a house, the value of the house goes every year. You put it up with the bank and should something happen in your life and if you're not able to pay back your loan, you have a risk of losing your house to the bank. Furthermore, valuing the house or your collateral is not easy. It takes a lot of paperwork. It requires some legal work, uh, field visits, etc. It's a lot of uh, hassle. It's, uh, it's an extended time period and it requires significant negotiation. So that is a emotional cost uh, that you should consider. On the other hand, when you talk about secured loans, uh, you if you do not have an asset to put up, what you could do is that you could ask someone, usually a father, to co-sign the loan with you, which means you can, which means the father or the co-signer will be the person who vouches for your ability to pay back a loan. So if you get 50 lakhs, if you are straight away going for MS from undergrad, you do not have any income in your history, you do not have any debt in your history, the bank for you as a bank. If I'm a bank, if I look at you, I do not understand anything about you. And, and in that case, the co-signer, the father, whoever co-signs the, line, uh, the loan with you would be the person who assumes the risk that, okay, everything is okay. I will make sure that we repay back the loan. Now, there are challenges there. Uh, you need to, uh, essentially, you need a co-signer who has a good credit profile, has good income, uh, good credit score, and also, uh, the emotional cost is that you are basically transferring debt to someone else, uh, and a lot of people feel uncomfortable with that. So this is a slide that I skipped up, uh, and uh, this is a very important slide. This is a question that I face all the time. So I've been working with quality finance for almost three years, and this is a question they ask me. I want the full tuition amount at the lowest cost. Now, when people talk about lowest cost, that's, that could be a very, it, it's a term that can be vague and it depends on how you define it. 
if you define it from just a financial point of view, uh, an interest rate could be an indicator. But as I'll talk later, even interest rate does not reveal your actual cost. And of course, if you are just looking at interest rate, you do not even consider all the emotional uh, burden there is when taking an education loan. So coming into interest rate and what it means for you. So number one thing I want to straight up tell everyone is that all education loans will use variable rate. In fact, even home loans or any other loan in India that like your family or anybody else is looking to take, they're all variable rates. For India, the variable rate uh, floats on something called MCLR. For US, it's Prime. For UK, it's LIBOR. For Europe, it's Euribor. It really depends from which country you are. But the reality is all interest rates are variable. Wait time, the interest rate changes and it can go up, it can go down. Now, when it comes to defining what is your interest rate, it is a combination of two things. It is a combination of a fixed margin. The fixed margin does not change during the entire loan duration. If you take a loan for 10 years, for the full 10 year period, your fixed margin will not change. This fixed margin is usually assessed on the basis of creditworthiness, who we believe you are and how worthy you are. And it is defined by the lender. The lender has control over the fixed margin. And then I'd outset the fixed margin is variable base rate. Now variable rate base rate is not defined by the lender. It is a reflection of the market, of the economy, and it goes up and down. It depends on which economy you are. It can go up, it can go down. Uh, in the recent years, all economies, the variable rate has been going up. The MCLR has gone up, uh, the LIBOR has gone up, uh, the prime has gone up. The only exception is Euribor. So when a lender is telling you the interest rate, always, always ask them for the split. Ask them if they tell me this is my interest rate, what is the fixed part and what is the variable part? Also ask them how does that variable base rate change? Why? Because in India, MCLR is required only by commercial banks. So if you go to a SBI or Bank of Baroda, Punjab National Bank, they will all use MCLR, which is governed by the RBI. But private lenders and PFCs are not required, and they create their own variable base rates, which you can change at any point of time. Now, coming to the interest rate, uh, you might think that interest rate, if I get the lowest interest rate, that's great. If I get a 10% versus an 11%, obviously a 10% is cheaper one. Now, I'm here to tell you that that is not true. Interest rate alone will not tell you the true cost. And there are two, three things to consider there. Number one is, how is actually interest charge? Interest rate is not the only function in calculating the amount that is charged. So if you take money from a lender, be it home loan, education or any loan, you will be charged interest from the first take of disbursement. And the interest charge is a function of three things. It's a function of interest rate, of course, principal and time. Now, even if one lender has a lower interest rate, the actual interest charge might be higher simply because the principal and time, is, the principal is higher and the time is longer. And these are, there are a certain checklist that you can ask uh, to understand uh, these things. So number one is how is the interest being calculated? Is it being calculated simple or is it being calculated compound? If it is calculated compound, obviously the same interest rate Compound interest will have more interest charge compared to simple. So seemingly, it might look that, oh, I'm getting a slightly lower interest rate, but you might be getting charged more simply because it's compound versus simple. Property finance laws are simple. Usually most education laws are simple, but always, always do check with your lender. The second thing I would ask you to check is, are there any fees that is causing you borrow more than the tuition and living? So a good example is if you borrow in INR, if you're going to US and if you borrow in INR, 
you need to transfer money from India to US, which involves two things. Number one, the actual transfer from Indian account to US account. And secondly, converting the money from INR currency to USD currency. And these two conversions can be expensive. This season, we, uh, we were seeing a lot of students being charged 3 to 4% of their principal as a fee for converting the charges. So if someone borrowed 40 lakhs, they were actually paying 4% on top of it, which is uh, a significant amount, so as to speak. And even, if, even though you did not really consider like 40 lakhs in your uh, calculations, the reality is that you end up borrowing that and you will be charged interest on that and you will be having a higher principal, so you will be charged more. The other thing, uh, the, uh, the last two things are kind of similar. Um, what we have seen is that a lot of lenders might ask you to take the full disbursement upfront. What I mean by that is if you are studying in US or anywhere else, you are required to pay tuition on a semester basis. So if I have four semesters and my cost is $40,000, it approximately comes down to $10,000 each semester. Okay, so when I start, I start with only the principal only is 10K, then my principal increases to 20K, increases to 30K, then increases to 40K. However, if you take the full disbursement upfront, from the very start, your principal is 40K. And for that time period, where you could have actually staggered your borrowing, you have been charged way more interest and you're losing money. Additionally, what a lot of people tend to think about is taking money in their accounts before I-20 in Visa, which is okay, which is fine. That's, that's a choice that people make. But what it means for you is that the interest will get charged from the first day of this first thing. So instead of September, if you get your I-20 in March, you are actually being charged interest for additional six months. That is a significant amount as well. So when you're thinking about these things, always remember that interest rate and interest charge are not the same thing. And is the lender employing right and ethical business practices to charge interest against your loan? Alongside interest is also fees. A lot of fees is required to be paid upfront. Others may ask you to pay later. Uh, so one example is, uh, and this is an example of Prodigy Finance. What we do is that we combine all of the different fees, everything about a loan, and make it into a single administrative fee. So if you take a loan from Prodigy Finance, you are charged two and a half percent of the principal as a fee. That's fine. That there's only one fee. What other lenders can do, there's another structure, which is that they will split the fees into different, different components. The different components individually are small and innocuous in size, but if you combine them together, there's a chance that that combined amount can be significantly large. Now, this number varies from lender to lender, and I cannot comment about others, but I, would, I can mention the different fees that are associated. Sometimes the lenders will mention all the fees upfront. Sometimes they mention the fees later on. So one example is processing fee. You're charged one person processing fee. There could be an assessment fee. If you're looking at a collateral loan, there'll be a lot of fees associated with valuing your property, et cetera. Um, there's of course, as I mentioned, the FX conversion charges. Uh, a lot of lenders will ask you to take insurance. Uh, and with all of these fees, uh, guess what is added? Uh, GST. So with all of that, add GST as well. So just think about these things. Keep in mind that there can be multiple fee structures. One is a single fee and then other is splitting fees into multiple components. Um, yeah, so those are fees. Now, I'm just talking about uh, some of the challenges that I've heard from students uh, this year. So we had Arvind who went to Stony Brook. Uh, his poor father actually had to uh, take leave for two days from office and go to the bank and explain to them how to send funds to the college. Quite terrible. Other, length, other person, Pooja, uh, she was really, really happy about that, uh, about quality financial experience because our loans were in USD. There were no FX charges 
and all of our friends had a terrible time uh, containing the FS charges because they were getting significantly out of time. Disbursement is a massive step in your study abroad. If you don't have your money dispersed to the university, you will not be allowed to sit in classes and complete your degree. So it's not only a fun, it's not only an emotional cost because if the money does not reach university, you cannot attend. It is also a financial cost because there might be hidden charges during disbursements that are not informed to you upfront, and it might be a surprise for you later on. So the word of advice that we would say is, please do your research, please do your homework, talk to your lender as much as possible, and make sure you understand all of the steps and all of the fees that you will be incurring in processing those disbursements. Last year, uh, quickly on repayment. Uh, so uh, this is a question that we always ask, where you see yourself in three years, in five years, um, maybe three years is a better way to frame because uh, you get the three year OPT. So you study for two years and then you have three years OPT. So five years down the line, where do you see yourself? Uh, most of them see, if you're going to US to study, most of the students that like we have talked to say they see themselves in the US, they wanna at least play out the three year OPT and then see what is up next. If you're gonna play out the three years OPT, if you're gonna stay in the US for five years, what it means for you is that you will be borrowing or let me rephrase this. You will be spending in USD for those first two years, and you will be earning in USD for the three-year OPT. So if you're spending in USD, and if you're earning it again in USD, then instead of having another currency, you can simply borrow in USD, spend in USD, earn in USD, and repay back in USD. Saves a lot of hassles. It saves all of those conversion charges. And more importantly, uh, there can be FX fluctuations and you're isolated from them. So always ask key questions like, are interest rate, uh, sorry, interest payments obligatory during your studies because that can be an emotional burden for your parents. Does the lender have the, the capability to accept money from anywhere in the world? Will you be charged again additional FX charges for converting your USD salary to your INR payment. Think about what is your, what is the currency you plan to earn, obviously. Uh, what is the time period in which you want to repay back a loan? Uh, for property finance, we do not have any prepayment penalties. A lot of students who take from uh, loans from us, they plan to study for two years, earn OPT in three years, pay back the loan in three years, and then cycle with the life. What is the time period that you're looking to repay back loan? There are also uh, things like tax benefits. Uh, so local Indian lenders allow your family to claim tax benefits, but, but always keep in mind that the tax benefits are only on the interest that is repaid, not on the total principal, not on the total amount, only that on the interest that is repaid, which is a significantly smaller portion of the total amount. And also, uh, there is a maximum benefit limit defined by the government uh, under Section 80C or 80E, I'm not sure. Should, I should know, but uh, it, under Section 80, there is a limit. And depending on your family level, uh, on your income level, your tax exemptions can vary from nil, 10%, 20%, 30%. So always keep in mind. Furthermore, if your parents are retired or something, uh, tax benefits really are not applicable. And most importantly, uh, if you are studying and working in US, tax benefits don't mean anything for you. So, so when you talk or when I talk about the true cost of a loan, to summarize, the true cost of a loan is unique for everyone. Everybody has different financial needs, different emotional needs, different loan terms, different loan processes. So please, please, check with every lender and see what is a true cost for you with each lender. And when it comes to understanding what is a true cost, think about the next five, six things. Think about transparency. If the lender is transparent with you, if they're honest with you, if you can find their FAQs and all the details on the website, on a brochure, and you know exactly what you're getting into, that eases a lot of burden. It doesn't, you don't need to worry too much about it. 
Second is flexibility. Is it linked to flexible? If if I need if my situation changes in the future, I trust me, things change. If your situation changes in the future, is it linked to flexible enough uh, to help me with my change situation? Thirdly, trust. Scaring abroad with an education loan, huge scare. You're leaving a your country, as I said, you're leaving a your country, you're leaving your friends and family behind, massive debt, studying again, don't have a job, so much uncertainty, and you at least need to have trust with the one person who's financing you. And with trust, you also require speed. Like, what is the speed with which things that resolve? What is the speed with which you can get your application approved? What is the speed at which lender responds to you? What is the speed with which your problems are resolved? And lastly, think about the financial aspect. Of course, uh, one of the things to think about is something called APR, that is annual percentage rate. Uh, now, all of the things I talked about from a financial point of view, how your interest is calculated, how it is charged, your fees, etc. What APR does is it combines all of those crazy small, small things into a single number. And since APR is a sum of interest rate, how it is calculated and fees, APR is always greater than interest rate. So please check APR. Property finance is always tell APR, the annual percentage rate, what is the effective cost of borrowing. And if lenders are not disclosing it, it is difficult to compare on a financial point of view, but do not uh, use APR versus interest rate. That would be a policy. Great, so what do you value? It's up to you. Uh, but for now, thank you so much.